you uh, filled in a form to claim compensation. Despite the fact that you called them several times and said, I was there, they didn't want to know. Why do you think that was? I think they were trying to conclude their investigation or get their own story out, get that firm in the public mindset before anything came in which could ch challenge it. Because what I had seen may have actually challenged some of the witness reports that they had taken or some of the statements they had got out of people. So there was one Australian woman who was saying all sorts of stuff about the bus. And she said, oh yeah, I was on the lower deck of the bus and the, a part of the bomb was in my knee. And she's saying all sorts of stuff. And I'm thinking, who is this woman? Where did they get her from? Maybe she was on the lower deck, but I mean, the stuff she was saying was, I mean, it didn't really add up. So obviously some people have been coached and they got their story and that was what they succeeded in doing. Okay, so they didn't want the testimony of somebody mm. who was observant like mm. you and you'd, mm. you'd spoken to people yeah. about this and you'd spoken to this woman that mm. you hitched up with at the scene that you then subsequently thought, according to what you write in the book, was an agent. Well, I initially didn't suspect her of anything. It was only further down the line when um, she was trying to lead me in certain directions and then I started thinking back, well, she happened to be just in Tavistock Square in one of the buildings halfway down Tavistock Square. Was she there on purpose for a reason or had she been going to work, as she told me? And then I actually found out where she worked and done a bit of digging about and her story wasn't checking out. So that led me to actually suspect her of having ulterior motives for being with me rather than just boy meets girl as okay. I thought it was that morning. All right, let's talk about your friend, the, the, the chap who died on the, on the bus, mm -hmm. or did he die on the bus, a Christian Small. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, an old friend of yours. I mean, this is a bit of a coincidence, actually, mm -hmm. that you saw him on the day, but this is a friend of yours that you saw outside Euston Station and said hi to, because he was an old friend of yours. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, well, t take the story up from there. Tell me what happened to Christian. Well, I saw him at Euston coming out from the um, mainland station trying to get a bus or... Just like you were. ...heading towards the buses. I was hesitant, hanging about. I was in WH Sniff, leafing through a few magazines and stuff. But I saw him... We, the previous week, we had been in a club in Notting Hill, actually, called... It was a bar in Notting Hill. So I said hi. He couldn't stop. He was busy. Then what happened a week or so later was in the newspaper, they announced that he had died on the Piccadilly tube train. And I'm saying that's impossible. Firstly, because he would have had to have died at 8.51, which was 15 to 20 minutes before I saw him in um, Houston. So that was one of the things... Maybe that was one of the coincidences which changed my aspect in terms of surviving this thing and what happened to me. But he is dead, isn't he? He is. He so died where, that day. Where, where did he die then? On the bus? He, of course, he died on the bus. But you didn't see him get on the bus? I didn't see him get on the bus because he would have been on the upper deck. So that is one of the things which I thought... That to me, there's, he could only have been on the bus because he was in Houston. To have died on the train, you can't be in Houston then have died on the train. Time doesn't work like that. No, I know, but I'm just a bit confused now. Mm. I mean, I, I understand that the chap with white hair, you would have seen mm. him getting yeah. off the bus. Mm. So if he had been on the mm. upper deck, mm. you would have seen him get off. And, yeah. But you didn't see your friend get on. Or... No. So your friend got on mm. and you didn't see him. Mm. It could be, it just is possible, isn't it, that a terrorist got on with a rucksack. That doesn't really compute. My friend got on because he went straight there. I was dilly-dallying. So if he was at the front, he would have boarded one of the people who boarded before me. There weren't too many that boarded before me, but he would have been one of them. Okay. If I had been standing next to him, I would have, we would have been talking and we would have sat together upstairs at the back. So I don't know. It's just fate. It could be fate. It could be destiny that I... He went his way that morning, and I went my way that morning. Why were you lo leafing through magazines? Were you not keen to get to work? Or? I had no idea of how to get to work from Houston because I'd been totally thrown off, lo thrown off course. That's the thing. So I walked into the W. H. Smith is right near the exit. So I was waiting for some kind of 
someone to give us some information. So I just started. Oh, so you thought yeah. it might be an announcement saying you yeah, need to get back on the trains or something like that. Because you didn't yeah. know it was a bomb then, did you? No, no idea. We it just thought it was surge. a power surge. Yeah. So okay, that was my how I ended up eventually getting to um, the bus stop. But the thing is, it took a long time for buses to actually arrive that morning, about 25 minutes. Euston normally has tons of buses. Yeah, sure. 25 minutes and not one bus. So it was like... And there were lots biblical, of people there. It was like biblical scenes there when a bus appeared on the horizon, basically. So then it just all changed and I, I just dashed. I went... Psh. You two jumped. Proper. <laughs> OK. Well, I think you'll probably be forgiven for that. I mean, you're obviously a very lucky man, aren't you? Um, yeah, very fortunate man. So, uh, there you are in this, you're now in a relationship with this lady. Do you want to name her? It's probably um, not her name anyway, is it? Um, I feel no need to name her, okay. to name and shame. I wasn't in a relationship with her. I was taken with the prospect of being in a relationship with her because of the manner in which we had met. We had met on Tavistock Square. Covered a, in blood. Well, um, actually, I'll, I'll go into a little something, something about that. There was a woman who was covered in blood. Okay, yeah. I was escorting her. I wasn't. This is not the one you then had this. Yeah, of course. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to fall in love with a woman covered in blood. Well, it might be. <laughs> she was covered in blood. I was helping her, okay. and then as we were going to the building where they were helping, her, I saw this woman staring at me, and I thought, "Whoa!" It, but but even <laughs> even at that moment. Well, I didn't think who are like that, but I thought she was kind of nice. <laughs> anyway, okay. but this lady, she was she was so shocked she couldn't actually speak. I was trying to talk to this lady, she was shaken. So I had to deal with her, and that took around 15 minutes. You, ha you found help for her in yeah, inside yeah. one of the buildings there, didn't inside, you? Inside, yeah, a building. Linton House. Linton House on Tavistock Square. Yeah. Very helpful people there. So they provided um, water bandages, so on and so forth, plasters. I got a little plaster for my hand and all that stuff. And then when I came out, that was when I met this individual who I'd noticed when, as we'd been shuffling down Tavistock. Right, so she wasn't injured yeah. in any way. Then. She wasn't I hurt. Was a bit confused she then, wasn't so. hurt, no. Okay, so you got into this strange relationship with yeah, her. Yeah, strange, yeah. This, and all the time you're being followed by people, people are watching you, people have got into your apartment. Mm -hmm. Apparently, yeah. yeah. We'll talk a bit about about that, about what they did to show you that they'd been there. Oh, it's just standard things. I mean, these people are very skillful. They're very highly trained in covert surveillance. Well, not that covert, if you notice them. Well, they wanted you to see that they'd been well, there, didn't they? That's because they were trying to intimidate me at some points. So obviously, the, to intimidate someone, you've got to give them a show of force or scare them. So that's why they were a bit hot and cold. At times they were, I couldn't see anything and I was just getting on with my life, but I'm wondering, where are they? Where are they going to pop up from next? And then other times I'm just like, whatever. And they did things like, in your book you describe how you had a little bowl where you kept 20p pieces for meters or something. Oh, for the meters. car. Yeah, um, and yeah. there were five of them in there or mm. so you thought, but when you came home, mm. it was a pound coin. <laughs> yeah, that was They'd just... taken your 20p's and... And changed it for that you. Was, that was just one of the little games, mind games they kind of like to play, I suppose. But I didn't actually let that get to me, really, because if I had, I could see what they were trying to do. So um, I'm kind of a um, spiritual, willful sort of person. If something is wrong, I believe honesty is the best policy at the end of the day. So I had to um, put my case, regardless of whether people think everything I saw was 100% accurate. Some people have their own kind of points of view. People have been emailing me and suggesting this and suggesting that. I've, I don't mind listening to what you have actually come up with. They call them conspiracy theories, but I want to put a witness testimony, which is different from a conspiracy theory. So l l let's cut to the chase here then, um, Daniel, if we may. Uh, what do you think really happened on 7-7? Who was behind mm, it? I believe there was a shady British intelligence operation mounted under the cover of what were terror drills in London and 
many people died and lost their lives and lost loved ones. And I think that is evil. It's a false flag attack. And these things have happened going way back to the days of Rome. So, I mean, it's something that the people are unaware of and they need to be aware of and on the lookout for because in these times I think there's going to be more of them essentially so that's why I said I'm going to say what I've got to say for whatever reason that's the kind of person I am. Do you think it now makes you safer because if you hadn't said anything mm -hmm. publicly and written a book and been on websites I know you've got your own website the fourth bomb.com yeah and it's the number four isn't yeah, it? Yeah 40 for The fourth bomb.com uh, so you you You've gone public. I mean, do you think that saved you from perhaps being assassinated? Wasn't there a woman, for instance, who was in one of the buildings in Tavistock Square, went on the record as saying that she saw the bomb squad there before the bomb went off, and then suddenly died mysteriously? Mm. I, I think I read about that in a newspaper somewhere. Someone sent me a clipping about that. It's in your but, book. But with me, I just... It's not about me being safer, it's making London safer. I'm a Londoner, so I wanted everyone to be safer. If everyone is aware of what can be done to them, we all know London as a place where everyone can enjoy themselves and live. We're very diverse, very forward-thinking, and a great place to be. But there are people who will be ruthless and will kill anyone, regardless of whether they are... British, English, Londoners, foreigners, and seek to benefit from it. So, um, Okay, well, how do they benefit from it? By changing laws, making this wonderful city of ours into a totalitarian um, fascist state, essentially. Because that's what fascism is. It's futurism. It's to own the future. And the only way they can do that is by taking away our freedoms. And I want to be free like everyone else. So this is a way of me expressing my freedom. I mean, interestingly, it happened at the time of the G8 summit in Scotland, didn't it, that Tony Blair was at with George Bush and, and other leaders. Mm. Um, do you think maybe that was his way of saying to them something? If, if there was mm. an involvement? If there was a government involvement, let's just suppose mm. for a moment that there was government involvement, what do you think that message would have been from, from Tony Blair to those other G8 people? I don't think really Tony Blair was involved. I, there are shady departments far reaching higher than Tony Blair who can influence departments and get the people on the ground and manage them. So I wouldn't say it's directly, okay, the Labour government did it, New Labour did it. It's not that clear cut. But the British state is responsible for MI5. it. MI5? British intelligence. And it's funny because when I launched the um, site, got a bit of um, coverage, a, f a couple of thousand people hit the site, and then in December the 1st, 2006, I sent 13 emails to different people who may have been interested with the new footage and graphics and all the details and evidence I'd collected up until that point and then three days later I had something like 30,000 unique users so that's when it really started really going global so that was amazing that was what really kind of led to the book because the site was really the main means of getting the information out the internet and the internet is a powerful tool I wouldn't have written that if I couldn't have done a website no so uh, ha has any branch of the government, the police or the anti-terrorist squad or what, any of those people ever suggested that you weren't on the bus or that in some way you were involved in the bombs or...? Um, initially some people did try to say in December of 2006 that um, I was never on the bus and all that did was make me upload information showing me in the background by the bus wreckage looking around the corner and there's even footage of me running down the street from a helicopter as well taken from above which is kind of strange and that's it, online is it that it was online someone has still got it, i suppose so i mean there's no question of me not having been on the bus i even had blood on my shirt and from people who had died because the lady i escorted was smothered in blood and i escorted her so some of that blood 
Find right, some of your own blood, presumably. Well, that was just my hands, so it wasn't too bad. Okay, well, um, we're almost at the end of the show, yeah. Daniel. I mean, thank you very much yeah. for being so brave and coming yeah. on and giving your yeah. testimony. And